Ladies and gentlemen, a welcome, a warm welcome to all of you, both in person and online here in Washington, D.C., and joining us virtually from across the globe. My name is Ilva Tar, and I'm a non-resident senior fellow with the Europe Center at the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to have you with us today for this timely and important discussion on building a stable and secure Western Balkans. Despite recent progress in the EU enlargement, the Western Balkans uh, faces daunting challenges, including nationalism fueled by unresolved conflicts, economic hardships, ethnic tensions and political instability. The war in Ukraine has exacerbated these issues while external interference raises concerns about the region's future. Yet, hope persists. At least that's what we hope. The region's unwavering desire for the EU membership, a newfound political will among EU member states and the EU's growth plan have rekindled aspirations for a more tangible European future, provided that the Western Balkans continue the EU reforms and are accelerated as long as also the regional cooperation is enhanced. Today, we are honored to be joined by experts from the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, BIEPAG, a renowned group de dedicated to fostering constructive dialogue and advancing policy solutions for the region. Our panelists will guide us through uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina complex political lands landscape, assess the Kosovo-Serbia dialogues progress, and explore strategies for promoting stability and security. This event is part of Europe uh, Center uh, Balkans Forward Initiative, which aims to amplify regional voices and promote informed discussions about its future. And before we begin, please uh, join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Florian Bieber, Director, Center for Southeast European Studies, University of Graz. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Donika Amini, Director, Civicos Platform. Thank you for being here, Donika. Thanks for having us. Damir Kapidic, Associate Professor, University of Sarajevo. Thank you for being here, Damir. And Marko Kmezic, Senior Researcher, Center for Southeast Europe Studies, University of Graz. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to an insightful and engaging conversation as we discussed before we started. To our online audience, please join the discussion by submitting your questions through askac.org platform. We will address as many questions as time permits at the end of our conversation, which I'll start immediately with the first question. Florian, how has Russia's brutal war in Ukraine affected uh, the geopolitical uh, uh, climate in the Western Balkans, the political and the security landscape of the region? Well, I think to some degree what has been most striking is actually how little it changed domestic politics across the region. I mean, countries like Serbia or uh, Republika Srpska and Bosnia-Herzegovina remained, you know, kept all the channels open to Russia. So there hasn't been a major geopolitical realignment as a result of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, I think one of the things it highlighted, of course, the vulnerability of countries outside NATO and outside of the European Union, but that hasn't been really seized upon by the governments of the region. So. I think the biggest change has come from the outside, that the European Union has re-energized the enlargement process with Ukraine, uh, and that that provides an opportunity for the Western Balkans to kind of jump on the bandwagon of Ukraine's accession process. But I think we haven't really seen yet some kind of renewed enthusiasm to make use of that. And then I think the other element, which is, of course, a war in Europe, um, together with also the war in the Middle East, is a distraction for you know, the US is a distraction for the European Union, and it might create a window of opportunity for forces in the region for pursuing their own agenda, which might be disruptive. And we've seen this in terms of the deterioration of relations between Serbia and Kosovo, in particular the security issues we see in the north of Kosovo. Yeah, Donika, what are your thoughts on the impact of the Ukraine war in the region? Well, um, first of all, I mean, there are stages. Uh, in the beginning, we thought that this is really going to be a critical juncture in which, you know, Kosovo and Serbia will finally uh, have to find a solution, a sustainable solution, in order to close one security gap that is evident in the Western Balkans, apart from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, but it happened the other way around. You know, two years after, Serbia could still uh, stay on the fence. Uh, not aligning with EU foreign policy. And, uh, of course, there is a series of tensions which happened even before the war in Ukraine. They just became more uh, highlighted after, after the Russian intervention in Ukraine. Uh, and then what we have seen is that in the past year, uh, after consecutive uh, tensions, we had the EU and U.S. involvement through shuttle diplomacy using all leverage that they could. 
and yet coming up with a very weak document, such as the Brussels 2023 agreement, which hasn't been signed by the parties, and with an implementation plan that doesn't even look like an implementation plan. So what happened is that instead of having a more uh, creative approach and more sustainable approach in which, you know, uh, the, the long-term implications of the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue would be taken into consideration, what the EU and the US are doing, they're going for a quick fix, a quick fix that is putting more pressure on Kosovo to deliver and accommodate uh, Serbia's, in this case, Vucic's uh, request, but without really considering the long-term implication of whatever uh, is going to happen after the establishment. I promise of the we will talk more about, uh, specifically about uh, Kosovo and Serbia normalization dialogue uh, during our conversation. Uh, but I want to uh, ask you, Damir, on uh, what you think the impact of the war was in the region, if there was any. Well, certainly there was. I mean, what the Russian aggression in Ukraine exposed is political divisions about how the countries, but also within the countries, if we're speaking specifically about Bosnia, view the relationship towards Russia and towards Europe. This was sort of implicit all the time that there is this divide between political forces that would rather look to the east and those that would look to the west and those that would try to dabble in both. And this really put them at a test to say, OK, where do you belong? And we see that there are political forces, both in Serbia and in Bosnia and in Montenegro, who would rather sort of be either in between or at actually also support Russia if they could. Um, and the reaction or the um, response from the US, from the EU, has not been adequate enough to address this sort of... What should they have they done, both EU and the US, in your view? To address Be much this. more vocal about this. Just what saying more? It because out I think they have been pretty vocal about it. They have been about realignment, about aligning the foreign policies of the countries, but also calling out individual politicians to say, we need you to publicly say, not just send your foreign minister to say that we will realign, but publicly say that you actually support the European Union in its approach to the aggression in Ukraine. So those are things that, that I see as lacking. Mm. Uh, Florian, you wanted to say something before? Yeah, I mean, just briefly, I mean, I think also what we didn't see is any pressure. I mean, Serbia, which is not aligned, no sanctions, you can fly with, you know, about a dozen or half a dozen daily flights to Moscow, St. Petersburg, etc., like, has not has suffered any consequences of not aligning with foreign policy. I mean, and that's a serious issue. It's not just any foreign policy. It's sanctions, which are, you know, against a country which is committing, you know, most horrific aggression. So I think that's something where no pressure whatsoever. Yeah. In fact, rewards. The biggest EU grant to Serbia came now. Not before the aggression, but now. So there's no penalty for, for not aligning with foreign policy. But you guys had meetings this week, both in the Hill, on the Hill and the State Department. What did they answer? What did they say about this? Well, basically, <laughs> nothing. Really nothing. I mean, you don't get a sense that there is, that there is really an awareness that this is a problem. Um, just like with the issue of democracy. I mean, you know, Serbia is no longer a democracy, but this is not a problem, apparently in Brussels or in Washington. It's not really put on the agenda. And this is, you know, this is, I think, a great neglect of Western policy, of not for being much more forceful, much more also self-confident that, you know, U.S. voice and the EU voice matter in the region. Marco, your thoughts on the impact of the war uh, in, the, in the region? Well, much has been said uh, by my colleagues about the political aspects and political consequences. Of course, there are others, uh, there are security concerns and there are economic consequences. Uh, as much as the whole world and Europe in particular, uh, the Balkans uh, is impacted by the, by the uh, uh, energy uh, crisis caused okay. by the war in Ukraine. And uh, in this occasion, uh, contrary to these political interventions, uh, the EU has played a, a constructive role in the region. It has included the Western Balkans in a package of uh, assistance and financial help, uh, meaning to overcome uh, the difficulties over, uh, stemming from the uh, energy crisis. And when we talk about security concerns, uh, um, mostly obviously we're talking about uh, Russia's role in the Balkans, then it remains uh, curious to observe how uh, the space for Russia's influence is shrinking in those countries that actually do hold a firm stance and they took position, they align themselves with either one or the other side. So uh, uh, value judgment aside, 
uh, uh, what is wrong is actually to try to balance between the two superpowers because that just leaves uh, more ground for manipulation by both and the pressure just uh, uh, grows from both sides. Uh, and this we, we observe in particular in Serbia and in Bosnia and Herzegovina or in uh, Republika Srpska. We will talk more about Bosnia in a, in a bit. Donika had the something to add. The most negative impact is, you know, the stability trumps reforms. I mean, we're not talking about reforms. We're not talking about democratization. Uh, we are relying on autocratic leaders to provide short-term stability. Now, it's all about praising uh, Vucic, especially in Serbia, hoping that there is going to be a miracle and he will become a pro-Western leader and, and doing so by establishing the association or making pressure, pressure on Kosovo to accommodate it without a, a, a longer term I know term it's term. hard for you not and to, not to yeah, go after Vucic. Exactly. But, <laughs> and, but you know, that, me, that's the policy. We expected uh, the EU to be more persistent on reforms yeah. and democratization and now it's all about security and how not to start another war in the Balkans. And with Christopher Hill being in the Balkans now, it feels like we're back in the 90s. We're talking about how not to have a well, war. And he was how, part of the peace how, agreement. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so with him coming back to the Balkans, it really feels like the 90s. And this is, you know, after 23, 25 years, this is... I read a frightening a article yesterday from George Friedman. I don't know if you had the chance to see it, uh, titled The War, the Flame, uh, which he revealed uh, a troubling revelation of for a potential new war in the Balkans. I'm going to quote what he said. I've heard from two people I trust highly that Serbia is preparing for war. I hope these sources are wrong, but I think this will happen and spread beyond the Balkans. Florian, do you think this will really happen? Are there are these founded uh, concerns? I mean, we've heard these stories for a while. I find that's a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, you know, I think it's important to pay attention to what's going on in the Balkans, but it's not that there's a war looming around the corner. We have serious security challenges in the north of Kosovo. But I think, you know, we have to keep in mind Serbia is surrounded by NATO countries. I mean, you know, North Macedonia, Montenegro are NATO countries, as is Croatia. Um, the only two countries which are not in NATO are Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo. But NATO both, is present But there. both have a NATO yeah. presence or EU presence. So I think Serbia would risk a conflict with NATO in any regional conflict, and NATO can't afford not to react because of Russia. Yeah. So in that sense, I think the risk, unless NATO really drops the ball in the region, which I can't imagine it risking to do at the moment, uh, you know, I think what we're more likely to see is these local conflicts like we saw in the north of Kosovo. So not in a regional war, but local tensions uh, fanned by leaders like Vucic and others in the region who might see a benefit in that. That's the biggest risk. Damir, do you see a new war I happening in the region? I completely agree. I mean, the word war is becoming demographically impossible with the populations aging on the one hand and a very long... <laughs> Of aging very fast as well, and a very long stretch of um, young people basically not having any military training throughout the Balkans. It's small groups that actually can be sort of called upon to wage war, but that, that's not yeah, but a war. That's a small conflict. The, the doubt and is that they are state-supported. and that, I mean, Again, power for a war, you need people. For and you don't have the people anymore, so how mm -hmm. can you have a war? A conflict such as we have seen more recently, that's possible. These are small skirmishes, and there is enough international presence, and there can be even more through quick deployment, to actually keep that in check. So I don't see a war happening. And by the way, when you mention war to people in the Balkans, mm -hmm. the first thing that they do is buy suitcases just mm -hmm. to get out of there. So more? That's, yes, even I, more, even whoever more. Whoever could so has already left. Again, that, the, the question behind sort of the, the war scare, there's nobody to fight a war. Yeah. There's nobody who would fight a war for any of the leaders that we have mentioned, not to call names again. Okay, not that we have a problem uh, if you think you should name them. Uh, Marco. Uh, do you envision, do you think a war is a potential scenario in the Western Balkans? I'm hoping not, uh, of course, but um, I, I also hope the same in 1990s, uh, you know. Uh, uh, the, the problem is, uh, if there uh, is something to actually pinpoint, uh, we're still having the same politicians as we had in the 1990s in the region. Uh, pretty much all of them in name and in face were uh, those responsible for igniting those uh, wars and atrocities in the 1990s. And uh, once it happened that they were not actually scared and bogged down to the uh, uh, NATO threat. Uh, 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 so in this regard, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I agree with colleagues about these uh, small scale uh, uh, provocations, conflicts, uh, whatever you want to call them. 
and they will, I, I fear, increase uh, the more the democracy in the re the more democracy is uh, promoted, the more they feel pressured uh, domestically by democratic forces. The more they will resort to, you know, uh, 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 some violence uh, that will uh, divert, divert the attention from the democratic demands. So uh, if any of those parks will actually uh, uh, go and make a fire, that really I, I cannot predict. Yeah, Donika, uh, what should the both EU and the US do to prevent a potential war scenario like in the 90s? And I mean, that, what can they do to, to not let this fire uh, That was our main message here. I mean, uh, Democracy, rule of law, mm. that's the key. Anything else is not going to sustain but with that's the, the call, current system that's a call that we for, have. The, for the Western Balkan countries, not for the exactly. EU or the US. I'm asking the what US, the EU and the US should do, because they cannot elect the leaders in the region. Well, I mean, that I would, I would, yeah, I wouldn't be really, because I'm, I'm from Kosovo and uh, I wouldn't really go there, but... <laughs> apart, uh, apart from the president, <laughs> apart from president. Because I heard they this cannot prime yesterday minister. and I, I couldn't react because that would, you know, be like a very, very long intervention. But, like, uh, literally, this is, I, I still believe that the EU and the US have leverage, not only to serve as a ceasefire forces, the way they are trying to do now, but, you know, just responding to crisis, because in this way, they are basically incentivizing our leaders to constantly cause crisis in order to serve their authoritarian tendencies. So what we can do is work parallel. Of course, there is a need for more, you know, a persistent approach in the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue because we do have, there is there, the EU and US alignment. They just need to have a plan on how do we move from, you know, point A to point B to, to get the parties genuinely engaged in the dialogue mm -hmm. in order to really create this trust. And I still believe they have the leverage to do so. But on the other hand, and not turn a blind eye on the reforms. And what we have seen so far is just like, you can do whatever you want internally. We don't care about that. As long as you show up in Brussels and pretend that there is an agreement and just, you know, like uh, sort of make it look like there is a process that is producing something and is producing nothing. So uh, work in parallel because this is very important. So we don't talk about wars anymore, but we talk about reforms and make, uh, cre create this pressure in to, towards the leaders, but also among population, that we can really do it. Because, I mean, we look complex, but in comparison to Ukraine, and now Middle East, we are the easiest conflict to solve. Shouldn't and this, this is... pressure come from the public opinions of this country? Oh, yes, it's coming from the public from opinion. From the NGOs, uh, It is coming society. from there, and uh, that's the thing we should be supported by. Because uh, there have been protests in, in Serbia, because I'm coming back to Vucic, but there have been protests I in Serbia. I had no doubt on that. And because of, <laughs> of, of Kurti's, you know, approach in the northern part of Kosovo, yeah. like, it was completely diverted yeah. into that conflict, and no one actually took about what was going on in Serbia, which was great, okay. a mass protest against the regime. Florian? I mean, just to pick up on, on that, role, I mean, yeah. you know, we had like hundreds of thousands of people going to the streets in Belgrade, right? Yeah. And mm. they had no support from either US embassy or EU embassies. Yeah. Nobody came out and said, their demands are demands for democratic society. If you want to join the European Union, these are values which you should adhere to. You know, you don't have to go on the streets, but you can send messages. And there was no message. There was silence. Mm -hmm. And that silence was, was deafening uh, for democratic forces. So of course, people have to do the job themselves. They have to go on the streets. They have to elect democratic leaders. But it, basically, many of them see the West as complicit. Yep. And that's the problem. Yeah. Damir, you agree with the complicity? Com I mean, not just <laughs> that, but saying tacit support is not enough. It's not just sort of applauding on the sidelines. Sometimes you really need to step in and get your voice heard in a way that you say that. These, these are be this people, politicians, protesters, media, journalists, who I do support, who speak yeah. In but a, in a I think some, somehow like they're way. doing that, like giving not interviews in enough. media that are uh, yeah, independent and enough. supporting independent voices. Uh, Our more or less. Is shrinking. Yeah. And it's not becoming easier to even 
sell the EU project anymore because it has been stagnant for so many years. Yeah. Uh, and then on the other hand, you know, seeing that you can be an autocrat and still be appeased by the EU and, and the, the US, it doesn't even provide incentives for leaders who really want to make a change, if any, or opposition uh, forces to actually take over and make a change. But let me go back to Damir, because that's what I had in mind. What would be, Damir, the interest of the US or EU to support author authoritarian leaders? Well, they what you have, have in the title, stability. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. I mean, sometimes I always joke that Bosnia is a too stable country. Nothing's changing. <laughs> We've been stable for so long. It's the country where you have the most predictable elections that you can, I mean, I can, I can put, put an alarm basically on my clock and say that when elections are going to happen in the next six years almost. It's entirely predictable. Um, the point is that you all can also predict who's going to be in power. So sometimes stability is a good thing, but sometimes stability with autocrats is not a good thing. And that's, that's the problem. Like, you cannot build a democratic society with functioning rule of law where people actually see a future so that they don't have to buy the suitcases. If you have autocrats in power who light up trash fires and then sort of be the ones who are there to put them out. And that's the, what we've seen happening again and again, that the Alexander Vucic, the Milorad Dodiks, the uh, whatever you want. So there's a huge plethora of, of male leaders in the Balkans, sometimes flavor. even female ones, but it's mostly men, who actually are there to both ignite and put out the fires that they ignited. And that's not a solution. That, that's like a, a vicious circle that people are stuck in. I hope you'll agree with me. We need some hope in this discussion because you are making things <laughs> oh, <laughs> look so gloomy. <laughs> yeah. Now, Florian, I saw your uh, Twitter uh, posting one of the memes on the enlargement mm. with Ukraine, uh, EU, and the dog, and uh, Western Balkans, the cat that was looking <laughs> from afar. Like, what would you make of this uh, new enlargement will, new momentum? Mm. Is it? Is it any momentum, new momentum there? And I think it's a great opportunity, and this is maybe the positive sign, is that enlargement was dead before Ukraine came along. I mean, the process was not going anywhere. You had a commissioner in Brussels in charge who was, a, you know, basically a lackey of Viktor Orban, who pursued his agenda. And now, all of a sudden, there is EU political will for enlargement. It's seen as a European project again. Now, again, there are lots of technical difficulties in all of that, yeah. but I think there's a commitment of the EU to put it high on the agenda. And, of course, it's directed towards Ukraine, but it does open for the first time in a decade the door again for the Western Balkans. The pity is that the leaders in the region are not really seizing that momentum, and they are like the, the, the little sad cat who doesn't get the attention, you know, as the, as the dog does in that meme. But I think, it, you know, there is, an, there is an, a moment there which should be seized, and especially with the next commission coming in next year after the European elections, you know, there, there is going to be a more a heavy weight put behind this project. Again, the EU is not there yet in really seeing how to technically make it real. But, you know, we're talking about a potential scenario where within the next decade, 2030 is sometimes mentioned, membership could be possible for some countries. And that's really what, what is worth pushing for and also pushing governments in the region saying, you know, if you do your job, you could yeah. do it. I mean, somebody calculated at current speed, most countries would take, you know, decades, 60 years or something like that to join the European Union. But, you know, that slow speed is the result of the governments not doing what they, what they need to do. So if they really took it seriously, if they seized the Ukrainian moment, they really could join within a decade in the European Union. So, Damir, what could the Western Balkans leaders, apart from the sad face, do <laughs> to size this moment, this momentum of the enlargement? Well, they could start implementing the reforms that the European Union is asking from them for a very long time. That's one thing. I mean, it's not that the <laughs> Western cool. Balkans are not uh, are progressing that fast and the European Union needs to catch up. It's rather the other way around. I mean, both need some catching up, but it's just yeah. that you need to deliver as well. Um, and that's been lacking, I mean, for an obvious reason, because the European Union membership is, it's not, it's still an idea. There's no sort of end goal in sight yet in terms of be this timeline or in terms of concrete benefits that you would get. Okay. Uh, we'll come to the benefits soon. Yeah, I know exactly. that's a question that you want to ask. Um, and. We're slowly getting there, maybe, that once you see how much is, is, is possible, yeah. you will actually make those reforms. Because if it's just a few million here and there, that doesn't incentivize enough. 
Marco, on, on the um, new en enlargement momentum that well, the region the, should start. Exactly. Now, now the momentum is there, but it hasn't been there for a decade. And in the meantime, we need to uh, stop and look what has happened with the region. Uh, two things, uh, uh, a state capture. Uh, and uh, the second thing is um, uh, uh, this uh, vested interest of uh, the political elites that in the meantime became gatekeeper elites. So if we would like to see this uh, momentum going on, uh, and if we would like to see reforms implemented, as Damir has alleged, uh, that would mean uh, a lot of these gatekeeper elites would have to step down and possibly end up in jail, uh, doing serious uh, uh, jail time. And uh, then you simply stop and ask yourself, how realistic is that prospect without uh, uh, this uh, uh, top-down uh, pressure coming from the EU and the US and other uh, Western liberal um, uh, uh, friends of uh, the Western Balkans, but also at the same time from the bottom up, from these uh, civic society initiatives, uh, NGOs, independent state institutions that are terribly uh, important, and independent media that, that is crucial uh, in the region. Fundamental. Donika, on the Western Balkans Council capitalize on this renewed momentum for the EU enlargement? I mean, uh, before, before the war in Ukraine, uh, only a couple of EU member states would talk about enlargement. And that would be, you know, Germany and France fighting whether, you know, they should deepen or, uh, you know, like widen the, the union. And now it's with, with Ukraine, it's becoming more uh, a persistent issue among member states, which is good. But then we really need a more creative EU in really insisting on the actual reforms, and we need to increase the demand for that across the region. And, you know, both of us need to work very hard. And for that, we need the support coming from the EU and the US, especially for the civil society media activists who are really trying to still maintain this critical mass, but also push for the countries, for how the countries should look like in, in the future. So yes, there is a momentum. It's a very small window of, of opportunity. We can use it. I mean, look at the region, it's so small. I mean, it's even like smaller, how many times smaller than Ukraine as a single country. We can do it, uh, but we just need to be more serious about it. Uh, Damir thinks we are small. Uh, the region is small, but it's fragmatized, I think. I don't know what he's they saying. <laughs> it's it's split up many ways. Yeah. Um, but I mean, what Donika was saying is that what is lacking is sort of a regional vision for the entire yeah, exactly. Western Balkans. Yeah. Um, it's very piecemeal so far. It's the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue. It's Bosnia's dysfunctionality. It's Montenegro polarizing, let's call it that way. There's mm -hmm. sort of very, very many small moments, but there's no coherent approach towards the Western Balkans as a whole. Like, you don't see... You see all the trees, but you don't see the forest. Mm. And that's what's missing both from the EU and the US. I mean, it's, it's, of course, you have sort of sovereignty for the countries, but you need to see that the entire region is so intertwined with each other that sometimes you also need a more broader picture to take a step back and create a strategy for the region, basically. So yeah. that's something that I see lacking mm -hmm. to some extent. Florian, to, to use uh, Damir's metaphor of the forest, is this new growth plan alluring forest? <laughs> for the Western Balkans countries? It's a very small forest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a start in realization, I think, that, that the European Union realized finally that countries which are not in the European Union get so much less funds, and that means that economically they cannot catch up anymore. And this is what we see. If you look at Croatia over the last decade, it's really taken off. And that's a lot with EU funds and resources which are available. Once you're an EU member state, so you get a lot more investment and you get better quality investment than you do once you're outside the EU because yeah. countries like Serbia or North Macedonia, they get a lot of investment, but that investment is less in terms of volume, but also problematic investment. You know, a lot of Chinese investment, which is investing in dirty energy, in uh, exploitative, you know, kind of exploiting the workforce. So you need to provide funds that the countries of the Western Balkans can catch up when they're ready to join rather than that gap increasing. But this growth plan is, you know, it's just, a, you know, it's a good start, but it's n by ways not, not enough to really get the job done. Damir. Definitely not enough, but I was also going to say that the investment is not just about development, mm. but also about security mm. of the region. You don't end up with loans such as Montenegro did that you cannot pay back to, mm. to Chinese companies and to the Chinese state. 
So this type of investment is also about creating more security. This is where you can use the sort of stable security mm. in an economic sense. Uh, but politically, that, that, that's not. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Donika, no, the 6 billion uh, euros instrument that the European Commission has uh, presented, do you think is a good opportunity? Uh, can the region make the most out of it and not be dependent on, dependent on other uh, economic uh, investments from China or other regions? Well, other uh, money coming from China is to challenge the EU and then uh, to some extent from, from Russia, but the Russia come, brings the political power mostly through, through Serbia and, and Republic of Srpska. But it is enough to start with, but uh, its real impact would have been different if we had sustainable governments and knowing how to actually utilize it. I mean, we don't know if we have uh, uh, absorbing capacities, we don't know where the money is going, how is it being invested. I mean, to, it, it's important to have like oversight mechanisms and functioning systems in order to make sure that the money that is being poured in the region is really going to make a difference for the region and not for the ruling elites. So this is a very questionable and you know with this, with the current systems that we have it's going to, going to be challenging but that's where why we are there you know we are going to be the vocal ones making sure uh, that uh, this doesn't happen. But this is a good starting point because this uh, the, the, the economic discrepancy but also this financial aid was really really uh, important during the COVID-19 pandemic yes. and you know one country that from you know the EU got more than three times, four times more than the entire Balkan region, which speaks volumes about you know the discrepancy between you know access to to, to funds if you are not part of the EU. Yeah, because yeah, they are not is, EU members. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Marco, what do you think of this new instrument? Uh, well, that the I'm going to continue playing the role of devil's advocate. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, but it is good, of course. No one can claim that is not. But uh, in the current setting. Uh, uh, of captured states that I've mentioned already and uh, lacking rule of law mechanisms and democracy, uh, there is a threat uh, that uh, these uh, uh, tremendous funds will be misused by the uh, 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 political elites uh, and presented as their you know, party loot. Uh, uh, we, we are now observing and keeping close eye on the uh, political campaign ahead of the elections in Serbia. And we see a lot of these uh, uh, functioneers campaign whereby uh, public resources are spent vastly in, a, in a, an electorate campaign uh, uh, and they're misused for the promotion of uh, the incumbent government. So uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, 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 the, uh, the growth package is a good thing for the Balkans, but it should not be offered without any uh, uh, conditions, uh, conditions attached should include promotion of uh, democracy and establishment of rule of law institutions that will monitor spending of the money, that will keep the elites in uh, checks and balances, etc. In that case, it would be a very good news for the for the region. Yeah, with strong monitoring, you're saying yes, but monitoring, strong monitoring. who the money goes to, and not how only, it's not be only from the outside, but actually enabling institutions, independent state institutions in the countries of the region to be yeah. able to uh, maintain checks and balances vis-a-vis -vis the, the political leads and their governments. Damir, I'm going to ask you the easiest question now. <laughs> <laughs> is there an easy question? Considering the all the political challenges that Bosnia-Herzegovina is going through, does Bosnia has a EU future in your view? Well, definitely yes, because everything else would be far worse. Mm -hmm. So it's, <laughs> quote, quoting famous people is very bad, but saying that it's, the, it's a bad solution, but it's the best one that we have. Mm -hmm. There's no other solution that can be better in any case. Mm -hmm. The problem with Bosnia is that you have to build a functional political system. What we do have currently is a stable political system, one that allows for checks and balances within the country so that no autocrat can take over governance of the entire country. That's mm -hmm. what we have. This is why democracy is not fluctuating or not stagnating, not backsliding to that extent that fast. But it's not efficient. It's not a system where you can make decisions. And there needs to be a balance between those two. So that is an internal Bosnian problem, mm -hmm. Bosnian-Herzegovinian problem, but also one where assistance from outside is needed. To achieve this, what kind because of the current are leaders that are in the that are in power 
are the ones that need to give up power mm -hmm. for this to change, and they're not willing to do so. And this can be external assistance that works together with citizens. Mm -hmm. So I've run a deliberative mini public with citizens on how to change our electoral reform and constitution, mm -hmm. together with uh, the European delegation, by the way. And that was, let's say, ignored by politicians themselves because it would require them to give up some power. More of such processes, more of such support is needed, where you speak to people who are outside of this very small circle of elites who have power given to them by the current political system. You need to go outside of that to see how Bosnia will change and what visions exist for a future Bosnia. Because, do they exist? Oh, they do. I mean, there's no agreement. I can't say that there is an agreement on what Bosnia should look like because there is none. But there are visions that are not being led, considered. are not being considered and are not led by the three ethno-political elites in power. Florian, what can the international community do to help Bosnia in this uh, stable and secure country? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very much what Damir outlined. And, and I mean, we have also a lot of damage being done. We have a high representative who has been very erratic in his behavior, who's made decisions, you know, for example, on election day, which I think really undermines democracy, no matter what the content, what do you think about the content of that decision? So I think even, you know, the principle of do no harm has been, uh, you know, disrupted in many ways of actually doing more harm than good. So being more cautious, being more strategic, and also trying to really, I mean, on one side, block those disruptive actors like Bilo Radodik who are really destroying the system, but also then being very careful in you know, basically tr fostering those forces which provide different ideas and which create these spaces. Um, and you know, the dissatisfaction is clear. We had massive protests nearly a decade ago in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And so the, the, you know, one has to ac accept that those ethno-nationalist leaders don't really speak in the name of all the people, and that there's just not enough space. And so creating spaces is really where international actors can help. And you know, it's a long-term process. It's not, it's not a quick fix. It's not about, let's have a, a you know, kind of forceful meeting to change the constitution overnight. Yeah. That's not going to work. But it's going to take a little bit more of a strategic vision. Anything you want to add on Bosnia? Uh, no, on Bosnia. Yeah. <laughs> I no. think, I, think I, I, I live in a very complex uh, country and I, I wouldn't meddle with another one. <laughs> uh, well, of course, I, I agree with, with colleagues uh, on Bosnia, but I think also it is important not to look at Bosnia mm. as an isolated mm -hmm. case, as an island. Yeah. Uh, 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 we, we've said before, I think, that uh, regional approach is needed and equal chances should be offered to all the countries of the region. Uh, in that way, not only I think the success would be better, but also this healthy competition between the countries in implementing reform would be um, spurred. And, uh, we are running out of time, and I have some questions uh, from online and I hope from in person. If you have a question, you can go to the microphone and we'll take it. Uh, but I have uh, to ask Donika her favorite question, which is, <laughs> What are the chances that uh, uh, the current format of uh, uh, Kosovo and Serbia normalization dialogue can be a success? Zero. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it is, it is sad because uh, we have been talking about need, the need to reformat the current uh, process. And it feels like, you know, you're just talking, uh, it's a one-way sort of investment that we from Kosovo, but also from Serbia are doing. Bring societies. I mean, this is a process which needs sustainability and needs more supporters. What we have seen in the past is they are even closing it even more. Now, they, do, they don't even have public statements until the EU comes up with a statement so we can't we don't even know what is going on and they are deciding on our future and how, how our country should look like in the future and internal functioning of it should be so uh, zero because um, it has been isolated completely detached from from the reality on the ground and it has been monopolized between uh, some people who really did not uh, take into consideration what is really happening again obsessing with quick fixes is not going to happen. What we seen in 2023, which was a breakthrough, it was very similar to 2013 breakthrough. It's literally the same agreement, which, you know, doesn't even have implementation mechanisms in place. Uh, so um, it, is, it is very worrying 
it's concerning that we are having elections in Serbia in four weeks, and then we are going to have EU elections and US elections, yeah. and maybe yeah. elections in Kosovo, and all these election cycles disrupt the process immensely. And while we do this, we are wasting time in the region. There are a lot of you know conflicts happening across the globe, obviously, which are bigger and need more attention, and they are draining the capacities of the West to actually deal with you know yeah. a frozen conflict that has been there for 30 years. Do I have some Someone in the panel that is more generous with grades, not just the zero, Florian? No, I wouldn't be more generous. I mean, I, you know, I think. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I think it's, at the moment the dialogue is there as a conflict management tool. It's not a nobody it's not expects. Even it's, yeah, it's not, nobody expects to resolve anything, but it's about just kind of keeping the conflict from escalating, like it happened in Banska in, in late September. But the problem is, you know, is there a willingness to reimagine it? So nobody says there should be no dialogue, but the question is how to have a new type of dialogue which brings societies in, because you know, hate speech has increased. The, the level of distrust has increased rather than you know uh, rather than become better so there's been no willingness to even contemplate that normalization means bringing societies along in this process yeah. none of this has happened in the last decade Marco well I could say 100 percent but that would envisage different actors mm -hmm. uh, uh, that would be local you mean uh, local different actors of course different politicians yeah. talking uh, <laughs> but uh, what I actually do mean uh, uh, in, in the current format zero of course, uh, and uh, uh, Florian has mentioned uh, the talk for more, the need for more dialogue, more talk. And this is not just bilateral talk between politicians. Uh, what is needed is also uh, dialogue uh, across these ethnic lines. So not coexistence, uh, uh, let alone peaceful, is not normalization. Uh, what is needed is actual uh, talk and dialogue uh, 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 looking into the past, uh, but in a way that is future oriented, uh, which would allow overcoming some of the difficulties and uh, finding common ground across these European values, which are uh, those that uh, countries have pledged to implement on their EU paths. Yeah. And secondly, it is important to have dialogue in uh, both societies alone in order to actually deflate this nationalistic rhetoric that has become so overwhelming over the past uh, decade yeah. that any kind of uh, uh, agreement uh, would be sim would simply not be accepted by uh, domestic uh, Thank public. You. Thank you, Marco. The time of uh, Western Balkans is running out. <laughs> I mean, literally, for this discussion at least. So I have to answer <laughs> the questions uh, that the, the audience um, has uh, sent to us. How do you practically translate the geopolitical impetus and the new momentum for enlargement and this window of opportunity into actual, actual change in the region? On the EU side, yes, but also and especially from within the region. What can the civil society organizations uh, that are not going to be the answer alone or primarily? Which in region actors can drive this change that we're talking here? Whoever wants to get the question. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it has to be governments. But what, what, what I think, if the message is clear from the EU side that membership is tangible, real, is not going to be blocked by individual member states like we've had Bulgaria blocking or, or Greece or, or France at some points. Um, if, the, if that is clear, then of course putting pressure on governments saying, you know, we have a, we have a real opportunity, so l deliver, show us what you're doing. And this is what, where we need then civil society to monitor and to say, you know, why are you not doing it? And that's what we said earlier. We need healthy competition where you can say, why are you slower than the neighboring country? Why is our government not delivering when our neighboring government is delivering? But for that, you need this dynamic. If that is there, civil actors, parties, and again, you need a renewed consensus that EU is the chief project. I mean, EU integration works when there is a consensus among all major political parties saying, this is the project we care about. We put aside our differences, but we don't have that in the region. Every, you know, if we take countries which are even have less controversies uh, that we talked about, in Albania, in North Macedonia, politics is so polarized that you even can't have a consensus on EU integration anymore. And that really is disruptive. So you need to kind of regroup all political forces to say this is our chief overriding political project. 
I have, an, I have other questions um, from the audience. This one is anonymous. We are hearing a lot about the responsibility, I think during our discussion, they heard a lot about the responsibility of the US and the EU for things going sideways in the region. When they have spent enormous resources on this region amid a major land war in Europe, which was in Ukraine. Yep. What about the responsibilities of the region, its leaders, its people, to shape a better future for itself? Whoever wants to take it. That's basically what we talked <laughs> uh, during, and you know, like we wouldn't be here if there would be more persisting approach in the past. I mean, now even if you sanction countries, it doesn't work anymore because it, it, it would have worked when the EU had the incentive. What we can do from the region is really cooperate more. I mean, this is something that I haven't been seeing in at least in the past five years, you know, cooperation between, you know, actors, local actors in Kosovo and Serbia, for instance, yeah. it has been diminishing track to uh, more independent media, learning from each other, joining forces, uh, increasing this competition between the governments for, for, for positive, yeah. of course, uh, for implementing reforms. I guess this is the only way we should we should do it, but we definitely need the help from, from abroad. Like, I, I know that constant we hear this, oh, we are tired of investing in this region, it has been 30 years, we are tired of living in the region, it has been 30 years, but we still need this uh, outsider's sort of assistance in order to make it. It's not easy. Thank you very much, uh, Florian, Donika, uh, Damir, and uh, Marco. Let's close it with this cry for help <laughs> 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 to continue uh, helping the region with all the setbacks that we discussed today. And let's close it with my opening remark. Hope persists, and uh, uh, we all can do more, and I hope we are going to do uh, the, the best that we can for our countries in the Western Balkans, indeed, with the help of the US and the EU. Thank you very much for being part of this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, and thank you for watching us.